Can we talk about Tales of Vesperia, the first strike? Because it's the first Tales movie adaptation that was ever made, and it's one of the only adaptations not to be a complete rehash of the events of the game it's based on. The only other adaptation that did that was Tales of Eternia, which was poorly received, as far as I can tell, from the My Anime List score. In fact, Tales of Vesperia The First Strike has the highest My Anime List score out of all of the Tales of adaptations, not including the smaller anime that they do, which include multiple Tales characters in a crossover. I'm speaking only about the the adaptations where it is based on a sole mothership title. And Tales of Vesperia was really well received for that. The only other ones being that well received were Tales of the Abyss's adaptation, Tales of Symphonia's three anime OVA adaptations, then just below those it was Tales of Zestaria the Cross. Now, Tales of Vesperia the First Strike is a prologue movie, and since it's a prologue movie, it adds a lot to the game experience without just, as I said, rehashing the events of the game. It's something completely different and new and fresh for the viewers, which adds more context to the world of the game as well as backstories of several characters, and with that it adds a lot to the game experience. The game came out after the Xbox version had been released, it maybe been a year or two since the Xbox version had been released, and then after that they brought out the PS3 version in Japan, I believe. And that's when they added in a lot of the features which show up in the new remastered Definitive Edition. One of those features is a side quest involving two of the characters from the film, those characters being Hiska and Shastel, the twins. We also have DLC costumes for Yuri and Flynn of their Fedrock Knights uniforms, both in normal form and in casual, and also a version of it for Estelle, who wasn't actually a knight ever, but it looks pretty cute. And we get all of this new content because the film is a prologue. It adds more context for the characters' backstories into the world and more chances for the team to kind of give hints to the film in the game which I think is really one of the selling points of the movie because it can appeal to people who aren't already Tales fans. You know, if people go and watch the Tales of Vesperia film, they get at the beginning a complete explanation of how Blastia work and, you know, kind of how the world functions. And then, you know, they're introduced to characters such as Yuri and Flynn and those are the only two main game characters who are shown a lot. The only other ones being shown are Estelle, she has one scene, Rita has one scene, and Raven has a couple of smaller scenes in there as well. There's also like a tiny cameo of Carol in the background at one point. He's just walking past, but he's there. Yeah, no Judas, unfortunately. Oh, also repeat. Sorry, repeat. Another main character who is who is in the game who is also shown quite a lot in the film. And that makes it a lot more accessible for people who haven't actually seen the Tales games yet. Because they get all this introduction, they get an introduction into the characters. Not, not all of the characters, but two of the main ones. And it, it sets up the scene for the game. So you could watch Tales of Vesperia the First Strike, decide, oh I really like this world, and then decide to pick up the game. And you would have a lot more context going into the game. You don't need to play the game with having watched the film before you play the game. Sure, it adds a lot of context and it's really interesting to see, but you can watch it afterwards. In fact, because the film came out after the original game, that's what a lot of people will have done. I certainly played the game before I ever knew that there was a film. So since I've waxed poetic about the success of the film for a little bit, let's talk about the good things it does. In particular, it sheds a lot more light on things that weren't quite explored in the main game or were kind of brought up but not really gone into depth on. One of those things in particular for me personally was Yuri and Flynn's relationship and the way that they act around each other having grown up together. Having played the Xbox version first and not the PS3 edition, a lot of content was not there in the original Xbox version because Flynn was never in your party for more than a single battle in the original game. So there wasn't a chance for him to be in skits to give more context onto their backstories. The only scenes that we had with him were the ones in the main plot, not including the scene outside of Zafius when you're rescuing Estelle. Also, he was in a 
couple of side quests, but not largely, and not enough to give that much context. A lot of what you heard about Flynn came from Yuri or from Estelle, because they're the only two characters who know him personally who can actually speak for him, since, you know, Repeat is a dog, he can't exactly speak. So seeing the way that they interact in the film really sheds a lot more light on the way that they have grown up together and and how things have changed for them. Because from what we know, they were childhood friends, they grew up together in the lower quarter and they interacted a lot and they probably fought a lot and they, they had to share a single sword because that's all they could afford. They grew up together and then at some point decided to join the knights and then Yuri left the knights and then the game starts. That's all you originally knew but with the context of the film it shows that at some point their relationship became quite tense and they got quite annoyed with each other because at the beginning of the film we see the two of them together they have to share a room at the knight's barracks as well as being now in the same squad and neither of them is really happy with it because you know they're, they're constantly bickering since Yuri is laid back casual and Flynn is a lot more uptight, serious, quite a neat freak. Over the course of the film, of course, we see that relationship develop. A core conflict of the film is the clash in morality between Yuri and Flynn as Yuri tries to deal with being in the nights when, you know, he, he went there to try and help people but even here he can't do anything because the higher ups in the capital won't lift a finger to try and help them and some sloppy rule is, is telling them that they can't do what's right to go and help people. Whereas Flynn has this internal conflict of having lost his father at quite a young age, his father having died due to disobeying orders in the nights and feeling that his father left nothing behind and that he died recklessly and for nothing. Thing, I suppose. And because of that, Flynn clearly has a distaste for what Yuri is doing since he's making the same mistakes that Flynn's father did in Flynn's eyes. However, over the course of the film, of course, we see that Bedrock, the captain, kind of shows Flynn that sometimes disobeying orders and dying in the course of those actions is worth it if you were saving the lives of the people around you. Because the capital, Alexei, they wouldn't have done anything about this. Knowing from the game what we do about Alexei, it's likely that he wouldn't have sent enough reinforcements to really help out anyway. Even though he's the commandant, he's always been quite power hungry. Though he his actions are, are to save the world in a sense, they are misguided and ultimately harmful. And as such, I don't think he would really help out for such a small place. I think he is more of a utilitarian kind of point of view, which, you know, it's, it's not great. So since Flynn, over the course of the film, begins to understand that there is no line, it's, it's a blur between whether it's right or wrong to follow orders or to do what you think is right but goes against the rules, that is a conflict that then carries over into the game. That's kind of the seed of him starting to question his own morality because before that he, he had quite a strong sense of morality as to what was right and what was wrong and he believed that what was right was to follow orders even if it meant having to wait on saving the lives of people who could have died. Though it frustrated him to know that they could have died, he he found it more important that he had to follow orders and not follow his father's example. Probably because a lot of the knights, having known his father, would always bring up his father to him. And it's Flynn mostly that I want to talk about from the film, which you might be able to tell by the fact that I've already rambled on about him for a little while. But his story in the game is ultimately made stronger by those seeds being sown in the movie adaptation. However, there is the caveat of a plot point in the film creating a tension with his plot within the game, and that is that he learns that Garista was in charge of, of many Blastia, and that he was the one using the fortress, which was the source of the air imbalance in the area. He, Garista, did not care if he wiped out the town because he just wanted to experiment with his new Blastia. And Flynn also finds out during a confrontation at the end of the film that Garista may have been partly or fully responsible for the death of Flynn's father. Knowing this, you can tell watching the scene that Flynn kind of lets his anger get the best of him 
for that scene, which I think might inform his actions during it. The Flynn that we know from the beginning of the film, and I would say from much of the game, probably would never attack someone without proper reasoning and, you know, with that being the last resort. And he certainly wouldn't kill them without that being the very, very last resort. Because he, in the game, is such a huge advocate of the law being what punishes criminals. There is a whole scene of him admonishing Yuri, well there's more than one scene of him admonishing Yuri for killing a member of the knights and a high-ranking member of the council because those criminals should have been punished justly within the eyes of the law however Yuri being his own judge and jury has taken their punishments into his own hands and slaughtered them. Saying that, clearly within the game Flynn already has that moral conflict going on within him and he already is kind of questioning whether he can really call Yuri evil for killing people when they were terrible, terrible people who, you know, Rago had already made sure that his punishment would be lessened. He'd only get a minor drop in rank rather than any imprisonment and Kumor is certain to have been able to do something similar due to his rank. Although we do learn later that his sister Mimula has lost her role as a noble, probably due to the actions of her brother. But then again, if Kimor had been alive, perhaps that would have been avoided and Kimor would still be a high-ranking noble and also still a captain of the knights. It's difficult to tell because obviously Kimor did die. But given that, it's strange to me then that in the film, Flynn helps Yuri in attacking Garista and then, in the course of that battle, killing him. Ultimately, it is Yuri who deals the killing blow to Garista. However, Flynn, having helped to wound Garista during the fight, and also not stopping Yuri from killing him, you know, helping to stop Garista from moving with the Blastia, Flynn is ultimately an accomplice in the murder of Garista. And he understands as much since he manages to get them both off the hook for it. The thing is, is it a Flynn action to kill someone and then try and get himself off the hook for it? It seems strange to me that in that instance he and Yuri both took Garista's punishment into their own hands. But then in the game, Flynn does not do that at all. He believes it's wrong to take someone else's punishment into your own hands, that they should be judged within the eyes of the law. So what I'm trying to deduce is why would Flynn do such a thing? Go to the lengths of murdering someone? Because that's it's not something that he can support within the game. I don't know if it has something to do with the area of the world that they are in. Since they are in Seasontania, it's quite remote. It's far from the capital. So would they be able to capture Garista and, and keep him under control until they got to the capital to give him a fair trial? Or would they have to find some other way of getting people to give him a trial? Or would Garista be able to weasel out of his punishment? Did Flynn help kill Garista just because of his rage? There's a lot of implications in that scene, which kind of carry over into the game if you watch it before the game. And even having watched it once before the game and once partway through on my current playthrough, it does give a lot more implications for the way that Flynn acts, I believe. Perhaps it speaks a little bit for his hesitation when it comes to Yuri. He does not hesitate so much, I would say, in disagreeing with Yuri's method of dealing with the criminals of the world. However, it does speak a lot for Flynn's moral confusion throughout the game and his questioning as to what is right, what is wrong, where is the black and white, where is the grey area there. I believe having killed someone before would make Flynn question these things a lot more. And that's something that the game doesn't explore that much as far as I've seen, which makes sense since, you know, the game came out before the film and with the definitive edition, there's only so much added content that they could put in. And I don't know if any of the added content quite addresses Garista. I don't believe it would, because that would be huge spoilers for the movie. <laughs> However, maybe they decided to spoil the movie. Who knows? In any case, though, I think it does add a layer to Flynn's character development that complicates it a lot more and makes him even more interesting as a character because without that kind of layer of having been involved in a crime like that before, it's easy to see Flynn as kind of the, the white knight paladin never do wrong, except he has done wrong. I think it also adds 
a layer of depth to the way that his relationship with Yuri goes into the game and the implications for Yuri's effect on him. Since Yuri's influence on Flynn is quite a major conflict when it comes to Soria, I think it's important to see things like in the game how even though Flynn was the one who instigated the battle, Yuri was the one who did the killing blow against Garista. And though it was Flynn's idea to go to Garista, and it was Flynn who began the argument. It might have been partially Yuri's influence on him to do that, or it may have just been part of Flynn's character as a whole, because I believe some people forget that Flynn can be just as hot-headed as Yuri at times. The two of them both enjoy fighting quite a lot, and Flynn clearly makes some decisions based on what Yuri does, and he gets angry quite easily, to be fair. The, the prime example of this, I think, would be during the tavern scene, when they have a pub fight. Yuri is the one who instigates the fight there, however, the moment he's punched, Flynn decides to join in because he, again, can be quite hot-headed and especially since he would have been younger at the time of the film, it makes sense that his decisions would perhaps be a little bit more impulsive at that time because the film takes place maybe about three years before the events of the game, so that would make him maybe like 18, 19 years old. And when you're 18 or 19, you can be a lot more impulsive than you are at 21, which is the age he's at in the game. He does carry over that hot-headedness into the, the game. He and his knights follow Estelle around for quite a while and, you know, in events such as Rigo's Manor, the moment that they hear something's going down, they're there. And it just goes to show how how quickly Flynn wants to help people. You know, he, he is the type to go headfirst into a situation to try and, and help. This is also kind of shown when he hops in and out of the party during the second act. How he comes in when he learns that Estelle has been kidnapped and then leaves only because he is forced to at Heracles. He has to make a decision between his, his platoon of knights or helping Yuri to save Estelle. And then he hops back into the party leading into Zauda because he needs to defeat Alexei for his own personal morals. He wants to take him down. Not so much kill him. I'm not sure that the eyes of the law would be able to judge Alexei fairly, however, since Alexei is the commandant. That would have been an interesting conflict to have. Even in the original Xbox version, when the knights meet you in the final corridor before the fight with Alexei, Flynn is there with them. Flynn and his knights are always right there at the scene of whatever is happening because Flynn barrels headfirst into whatever is happening because he wants to help. It's not that he cares about his rank or becoming commandant or whatever, which is kind of shown a little bit during a side quest where he speaks with Drake, Estelle's old swordmaster, and Drake is talking to him about becoming the commandant and Flynn says, I don't really care about my rank or anything. And even during the fight with Yuri and Flynn, they mention that they have always said they would use their swords to protect the people. With that being a major part of Flynn's character then, it makes sense that he is, he can be quite hot-headed and, and quick to go to the scenes of crimes and large events happening to try and stop them. However, it does, again, bring into question his decision to help kill Garista in the film. And I think that's something I'm going to be questioning for a little while, because, again, it does have such large implications for his character development. Perhaps he does think back to that time when he helped to kill Garista and he thinks, oh yeah, probably shouldn't do that again. In any case, we're not exactly going to get an answer here. There is no right or wrong answer when it comes to character development and stories. But I think it's interesting to try and think about because that is the, the main takeaway that I had from the film, which kind of led into my thoughts on the game, especially since I rewatched the film recently and I've been thinking about it quite often since then. Obviously there are other things in the film that I enjoyed and that I'd love to talk about because, again, the film really does add so much to the game, including, you know, things like even Rapide's backstory, since you see him as a puppy in the film and you see his mother, Lambert. Mother? Father? Lambert? You see Lambert? That's one of the parents of Rapide. It's very cute. You see how it comes to the point where Yuri and Rapide are off together. How Yuri takes Rapide away with him 
at the end of his time in the Knights. And obviously there's a lot of implications for Yuri's character in the film as well. You know, since he's the main protagonist of the game, it only makes sense for the film to really extrapolate more on his character. Because, just to kind of quickly go over it, he, in the film, begins to understand how futile it is trying to make a difference in an organisation like the Knights. Even though Flynn believes so deeply in his place as a Knight, Yuri from the beginning, I believe, kind of understands that this isn't quite where he belongs. Of the Knights, he's certainly the most reckless and following orders seems to never have been his strong suit. And it's over the course of the film, especially when Flynn returns and tells them the news that the Commandant isn't going to send any reinforcements until after a ceremony, that Yuri really understands how frustrating it is to be in an organisation where you're supposed to be able to help people, but in a situation where you can't help people. Not because you don't have the personal ability, but because the higher-ups are telling you, no, don't do that. And it really leads into his conflict in the game, since it's the seed of his frustration at a world in which he can't change anything. So he goes from trying to save people as a knight to then returning to the lower quarter and helping the people who he's grown up with his entire life. And that leads then into his efforts to try and recover the Aquablastia in the beginning of the game and how that quickly spirals into creating a guild, murdering some nobles, and trying to save the world ultimately. Yuri's story is certainly one that grows when the film is brought into mind. It really makes you understand why he left the night. For both him and Flynn there is a lot more context added from the scenes given in the film. So yeah, I believe that's about everything I wanted to speak about, so thank you very much for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this, it's kind of a new thing that I'm planning on doing here every once in a while. Just a, a casual little conversation about topics that I want to talk about but I can't speak about an analysis video because there's not quite enough content there or I can't really think of a way to pitch it as an analysis rather than just as kind of some floating theories and I can't bring it up in a let's play because spoilers like spoilers everywhere so I, I really hope you enjoyed this as this is an open discussion invitation please feel free to let me know your thoughts on tales of vesperia the first strike down below in the comments especially if you have any thoughts on what i spoke about in this video today with flynn's backstory and also with yuri's backstory even with rupine just if you have anything to say about anything that i spoke about today feel free to let me know down below i i love having discussions with people who have played the tales games or watched the tales adaptations because it really does just open up a new discussion on something that personally I'm really interested in and it's amazing to see other people who are also interested in it so yeah it'd be awesome to, to hear your thoughts if you feel like it. Anyway I'd like to thank you very much for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you enjoyed the, the background footage whatever it is I haven't quite decided yet. I hope you have a great day, night or whatever the time is for you and I will see you next time. I can't even win with a sword anymore. <laughs> Loser.